All right, well, um, thanks so much for joining us here for this panel. We have a really terrific lineup of speakers, and actually, maybe just to get started, I'd love to ask each of the speakers to introduce yourselves and say what your role is now. Thank you. My name is Sherry Lachman, and I'm the head of social impact at OpenAI. My name is Victor Lee. I'm an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education here at Stanford, and I also serve as the faculty lead of AI and education for the Stanford Accelerator for Learning. So my name is Sharad Sundarajan. I'm co-founder and uh, chief data and information officer at Merlin Mind. I'm Bob Akmesagimi. I'm an, an assistant superintendent for elementary education and student support in Gwinnett County Public Schools in Georgia. Very good. Well, just to, to get started, um, let me give a few framing remarks before we dive into the questions. So, there are so many different ways to think about and categorize AI. It, in the education context, one of the things I've found over the last few months and, and year is that it's easy to start talking about this and, and think about cheating and never get off of that. Uh, so, of course, that's something that a lot of educators are very worried about now, but there's also so many different dimensions of how this can be used. So, just to, to, to name a few, um, you, know, you can, of course, use these new AI tools to learn about things and to get facts and to, to really address the very, very specific questions that you have in a way that saves time and it's not repetitive, reading the same high-level summaries over and over again, but allowing you to dig deeper into the correct, the issue that you're interested in. Um, of course, the creation of content, but not just writing and summaries, but also creating visualizations, creating photos that illustrate the right things, diagrams. One of the things that we're seeing a lot in our teaching here in, in, at Stanford and in the business school where people are not as good at coding is you know, using natural language to do data visualization and kind of low code, no code analysis and presentation of data. Um, there's, there's using it for feedback, um, getting personalized feedback, and also being able to summarize the strengths and weaknesses of your own work while it's in draft form. Um, AI is useful for coaching and for helping you know, set, um, you know, set expectations, cheering you on, um, helping you keep track of milestones, and so on. And so all of those uses can be, can be done by the learner, but also by the teacher. So for the content creation, it's creating a, a reading that is summarizing exactly the right points for, for a class and again at the right level of detail and that addresses specific concepts. And data visualization can go for a teacher around how their, um, how their students are doing and having more nuanced um, understanding of the strengths and weaknesses. And then a final use case is helping the teacher help the students, or helping the, the coach help the students. And so making sure that you have the right information that's exactly addressing the student, where, the learner, where they are, what they need, and so on. And then, of course, we have also these different contexts. People can be using this in a formal education, in K-12, in college, as independent adult learners. It could be students using it after school at home, guided by the parents. And so there's lots and lots of different contexts. And that then also leads into the fact that these technologies are not used in a vacuum. We've already had, for a long time, a proliferation of information. There's Khan Academy, there's Coursera, there's all sorts of, of, of online materials that are available. There's lots of assignments available for teachers. So all that's been out there, but there's still the challenge of how do you curate it? How do you know which material is actually beneficial? And how do you motivate yourself to use it and use it effectively? So that, that context of putting this material, of which there's now even more content than there was before, in a sense, how, trying to, to decide how to use it and how to spend your time are other challenges. So all of these application areas, you know, I think go far beyond the question of, like, te te of cheating and assessment that is, has really gathered a lot of our immediate uh, fear and, and reactions. So with that uh, kind of broad introduction, let me turn over to some of the panelists to, to try to get a little bit deeper. And so, Sherry, let me just start with you. So it's a year after the successful launch of ChatGPT. 
And I'd love to hear your perspectives about how it's been integrated in ed education, and particularly, what is the adoption looking like of teachers and learners, and what do you think are the most promising applications? Thank you. Well, first of all, I feel like I'm cheating on this question because you just gave a perfect answer to it in explaining <laughs> the many applications that it's being used for, as well as some of uh, the limitations that we need to watch out for. Um, more generally, we imagine a world where every student has a personal tutor and where every teacher has both a personal assistant and a coach. This is the future that OpenAI and our partner organizations in the education field are building towards. So, thank you. <laughs> so, take uh, the Khan Academy, for example, which you were just talking about. We partnered with them uh, to develop Conmigo, which is an AI powered tutor for students and teaching assistant as well. We're now working with them to increase access to Conmigo in underserved communities. Many other or education organizations are, are building apps on our platform as well for a variety of educational uses, from developing classroom presentations to offering detailed feedback to students on their assignments. Beyond partnering with EdTech developers, we also offer direct access to our platform to teachers, college students, and to middle school and high school students who are 13 and older and who have parental consent. We've heard stories from teachers and students from around the world about the many creative ways they're using our platform directly, as well as other AI platforms. And many of those uses include what you mentioned, um, as well as developing lesson plans, improving students' language skills, and actually using um, our AI and instructing uh, their students to debate our AI to help the students sharpen their own arguments and enlarge their perspectives on the subjects they're learning in class. While we're inspired by the many ways teachers and students are already using our technology, we're even more excited about what they'll do next. Just this Monday, we unveiled uh, GPTs. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you in this room have read about this, know what GPTs are? All right, room full of tech nerds, I love it. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard of them yet, think of them as AI assistants or apps that anyone, and I mean, anyone with plain language can create and share widely on our platform. No coding is required. We gave early access to this technology to Warden educators Ethan and Lilak Malek to demonstrate what teachers can do with this GPT tool. And in a matter of days, uh, they went ahead and developed a teaching coach uh, with the GPT that helps teachers learn how to incorporate active learning activities into their lessons. They also developed, in a matter of days, a GPT, or in other words, an AI assistant that provides redline detailed feedback uh, to students on their writing. So uh, this is just an early sign of what's to come. I imagine that in the coming year, we'll see an explosion of GPTs created by teachers and students, both for themselves and for their peers around the world. And I can't wait to see what they create that I can't even dream of today. Well, we'll certainly, I think, need an AI to guide us through the AI um, with that explosion of content. So thanks so much for sharing that um, and, and sharing the, these frontline experiences. Let me turn now to, to Victor. Um, so when we're, we're thinking about all of these applications, there can be a lot of confusion. What do you think are the most common misunderstandings about AI today? Oh, that's a great question. Um, let me tell you three that I've been hearing the most, especially amongst educators. Um, one is that um, ChatGPT is all the AI that there is. It's wonderful. There's also Dolly, but there are also so many other things that have involved AI for decades and are ongoing and advancing image recognition, unlocking your phone, content recommendation. So all of this is part of AI, and when we're having the conversation about where to take AI in the future or the whole space of possibilities, that is all part of it. And it's fantastic that we have now chatbot interfaces that can engage, but there's a whole big world that we are yet to explore with respect to AI. Um, the second big misconception that I've been hearing with respect to it is, um, around the word intelligence, and so it's the assumption that the AI is 
more intelligent than humans or that intelligence is pretty broadly spanning, it is wildly impressive what a lot of the new AI tools can do. But it's still very different from people. It learns differently from people, and it will have a great synergy with people. But it is not the same as people. And so thinking about it or um, projecting ideas about uh, how it is thinking in the same way as us or making judgments the same way as us is not the right way to go in order for us to get the most out of AI. Um, the third one, actually, um, cheating has come up a lot, and this is a great opportunity to um, share some, some work that has been quite popular when I've talked with educators. So who here has heard about you know, the concerns with respect to cheating? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and the sense is right now, like, if you've tried um, chatbots such as ChatGPT or Bard or others, you can get it to write an essay, you can get it to write poems, you can write a play script, um, and it's really surprising the, the range of things it can do, and it looks very tempting. It looks like it might um, sort of be so tempting that it would corrupt. You know, it, it's going to create a cheating epidemic. But um, this past summer, uh, my colleague, Denise Pope, who's sitting over there, and her organization, Challenge Success, and I had worked together um, because we happened to have access to um, a decade of cheating data prior to the words ChatGPT even <laughs> entering the lexicon. And so we had actually a benchmark there, and after uh, ChatGPT had come out, had uh, the ability to go and collect some new data with some of the same schools um, regarding cheating. And um, while it looks like it would be this corrupting thing, it is not. It did not change the levels of cheating. Especially when you look at the types of things that you think, oh, people are gonna copy and paste or claim that content as their own. No, and in fact, in some schools, there was a decrease. But the students, and this is high school students, the students have strong feelings about it. They do think that it's inappropriate to use it for a range of assignments, but they also think it's very appropriate and should be used as an aid, as a starter, as a tool to polish some of the work that they've done. And that's a really big opening for a conversation about what would technology look like, um, especially with AI in schools and, and what kinds of possibilities might that open for teachers and students. That's super interesting, and it's great that you actually are able to put some numbers on this to help ground us. I think for me, one of the places beyond the classroom that I've seen this so far, though, is that I've gotten, we used to have be able to use as a screening device whether a student sent you a very informed email when they asked you to be a research assistant. And I have to say, I've had a proliferation of beautifully written emails that <laughs> draw from my website about how their match with my research is perfect. And sadly, that carries very little information content uh, these days. So, um, well, so if we're trying to, to cut through all of this and really you know, get more data, research seems like it would play a pretty important role. So how do you, how do you see research helping us um, in this time of great change? Well, um, I think the cheating example provides one where we have these hunches or intuitions that come out from the media. And you know, as scholars and scientists, one of the things we want to do is get the data and, and see what actually bears out. Um, but I would also draw on another analogy. So we've talked a lot about, and we're going to continue talking a lot about education. But um, just picture in your mind uh, medicine and healthcare, and think about what is the relationship that research and academic institutions and universities play with respect to that. They are integral. They host the medical schools and the research hospitals, and it is where some of the basic research on the fundamental mechanisms of life and body systems are at work. It is also where new drugs are being discovered and developed, and it is also where public health research, new technologies, new protocols and procedures. And it's really important that we have that space because in the university setting and for research, in addition to asking questions to challenge our assumptions or to sort of elaborate our understandings, we will be a test bed for some of these new ideas, and that becomes something that we then see later in practice and uh, commercialized, used in industry, or taken up in the nonprofit sector. So I think that when we think about how is research involved, it's not just going to be um, saying this worked more than this, which will be valuable information, but we're going to be generating entirely new ideas. We're going to be sharing some of the most cutting edge information. Um, and hopefully, as we engage more, speed up that cycle and make sure that the questions that are being asked and answered feel like they're making some real headway in progress. 
Absolutely. And I mean, one, one challenge with new technologies that can happen is that people can kind of sit from far away and talk about risks and try to make policy around those risks without necessarily um, really understanding what the important risks are. Or they can focus on problem A, but actually problem B is a bigger one. And so, you know, I think I've certainly observed that through the past revolutions with this one could be no different. Um, you've talked about how in Stanford we're able to already kind of get our hands dirty and really be a part of that technological revolution. But what about you know outside of Stanford? How, how does how do we partner with tech companies or ed tech organizations to really gain the a, a deeper understanding of of what the challenges and opportunities are? I mean, I think forums like this are one demonstration, and it's get those conversations started. Um, we need to have two-way conversations about what are the questions that everybody has and what are the lessons that we know from history, recent history, past history, um, in terms of what works and what doesn't. We know quite a lot about learning and learning environments, teaching in schools, both in terms of day-to-day -day practical wisdom and also things that have been proven in study after study. And making sure that we can have that open communication and get that out to market to address sort of the last panel's comment that um, you know, evidence is not necessarily the primary factor in the selection of educational technology products. We want to change that and we want also to create a culture that we, we are committed to finding things that work finding things that meet our goals, finding things that are really in, informed by the best knowledge that we have available. And some of the concrete steps that we could take besides starting those conversations is data sharing agreements. There is an abundance of data that are being collected and there's a lot of fascinating techniques and approaches um, and new ways that we could talk jointly about instrumentation to be able to answer some of the hard questions that require large amounts of data. There's going to be um, whole ranges of contexts and access and situations where we can actually put some of our theories in harm's way and find out, does this hold up in this particular setting? Does this hold up with populations that are not near a university or not nearby this particular business? And those are important types of things that we want to make sure we do by way of these partnerships. So those are a few of the ways um, by sharing the data, the infrastructure, um, engaging conversations. And then I think there's always a lot of fun in uh, having some blue sky ideas um, and letting the imagination run wild and, and trying it out. Absolutely. And one thing I've seen here at Stanford is that we have just, you know, hundreds or even thousands of students who are really motivated to do something for impact. They want to get involved. They want to get involved in AI. And, you know, they might get a summer internship targeting ads, which would be a great learning experience. But if you offered them instead the opportunity, and not just during the summer, to, to work with a partner and really put those and really work on something that's meaningful to them, especially while they're in university. There, there's just so many people who would like to have that opportunity, and the faculty too, for that matter. So these kinds of partnerships can be really fruitful and help, you know, especially help um, young firms who have trouble getting talent, you know, scale quickly. So thanks for your efforts um, there. Well, let me let me turn now to to Babak and ask you about what you've been doing, which is just amazing in in Gwinnett District. You know, you've been taking this fascinating approach to embedding AI literacy across subjects, and I would love to hear more about how that's been working and what the reactions have been from the parents and the learners and the teachers. Sure, so it's been perfect and there are no problems. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we, uh, so, so Gwinnett County for Context is uh, located just north of Atlanta, Georgia. We have 180,000 students, so we're the 12th largest school system in the country. Um, and we made bets on AI starting in 2017, back when people literally are looking at us like, what in the world are you talking about? Like, why, what, A what? Like, they're thinking Terminator, like, that's the only thing that they can think about, right? Um, and uh, to be honest, we didn't know what the heck AI was either, right? We're like, maybe it's a little extra computer science, maybe it's like, I don't know, some math, like, we don't, we didn't really know what it was, right? But over the course of five years, what we realized, um, and we, what we realized really at the beginning was like, the whole point of, of education is to prepare kids for their future. Right, um, And a kid who's in kindergarten today won't graduate from high school until about 2036, okay? That's crazy, 
right? When we look at what's going on in a kindergarten class today, I would argue it's not preparing a kid for that world, right? We don't even really know what that world's gonna be, but we sure as heck know it's not the same world that I came up in. Uh, and our kindergarten classes look closer to what I was raised in for kindergarten than they do what 2036 looks like, right? And so as we started looking at this, we're like, okay, how do we prevent this from being like computer science? Uh, and by that I mean that one class in the corner where all the geeks go to uh, and like no one else knew anything about it, right? Like how do we actually make it a mainstream subject where everybody understands how it's integrated into everything we do in life um, and will continue to be so, right? Um, and so what we did was we sort of jumped all in, right? Like this cheating conversation is super interesting to me. You'd think as an assistant superintendent over curriculum and instruction, I would care a lot about it, but I don't because if an assignment is easy enough to be cheated on with ChatGPT, then it wasn't a good assignment, right? Um, and so, um, the, so here's the thing though, we have 23,000 staff people, 12,500 teachers, right? So like how do you get people who, who are in, in that environment, who like no one went uh, to learn how to be a kindergarten teacher, it's like teach kids AI, right? Um, but what they did do is they did all, all sign up to prepare kids for their future. Uh, and so we utilized that to, to say, okay, let's do two things at once. Let's build out a three course pathway that we embed in career and technical education um, that is for our scuba divers, our kids who like wanna do AI for the rest of their life, right? Um, and at the same time, let's redefine who that is. Let's make sure the class has representation among all our various groups in Gwinnett. So Gwinnett County Public Schools is located in Gwinnett County, Georgia, uh, which is the seventh most diverse county in the entire country. And diverse on, along the lines of what's the probability of if you run into someone else on the street that they are of a different ethnicity than you, right? Um, and so we are remarkably diverse, a very sort of integrated county. Um, and we're not super rich. We have 65% of our students receive uh, free and reduced price lunch right? Um, but that's exactly who we wanted to make sure that we were reaching. So over the course of the last, last uh, couple of years, uh, we essentially built out um, a pilot program, uh, an AI-themed high school, uh, which is uh, open enrollment for everybody in a regular zone, so it's not like a magnet or anything like that. We started building a K-8 pipeline where we started looking at like regular lessons. So when you're in social studies class, what's the AI piece there? What's the future readiness piece in your kindergarten classroom? Um, and we built out a framework where uh, we look very deeply at uh, creative problem solving, at human-centered design, at ethics because ethics is a big piece, um, at, at the actual like computer science and programming side of things, um, and also just like the real world applications within and across all subject areas. Um, so yeah, so at the end of the day, what we ended up doing was we created a sort of a discrete model of teaching kids about AI, and that's been, we're in year two of that, it's been super successful. Some other schools in, in Georgia are starting to do it and some other places as well. Um, but I think the most important innovation is how do we get into the classroom for every kid? Um, and we're not 100% uh, there yet, right? And we are starting with a small pilot of like uh, about 7,000 kids, um, but we're quickly growing it to our, um, to our county of 180,000 and hopefully beyond. Wow. That is so fascinating. I <laughs> we have a great team. We have a great team. And I know that we're all going to learn so much from what you've done because I mean, even teaching at Stanford, you know, we're trying, we, we did a survey in, in my school and you know, at the business school and only a, a, a small set of faculty felt like they were prepared to integrate it into their classroom. So, you know, I think this is gonna be a community effort for us to all come up with best practices. So, um, Sherrod, a kid, I'd love to turn to you and hear about what you're doing at Merlin Mind. I know you have a unique vantage point building AI models and using LLMs and solutions for education. Um, can you tell us a little about what you're up to? Sure, well, I'm on this side of the uh, line. Um, so, first of all, I think we strongly believe uh, that AI should be purpose-built and beneficial. So I think uh, uh, we've been very intentional about two things, context and safety. You know? Uh, and, and by that, you know, as a startup, and this is our sixth year, uh, we've been trying to understand the classroom, the teacher, the use cases, the pain points. Um, and uh, a quick anecdote, very, within a few months of us starting uh, sometime in 2018, uh, within a few months, we put a contraption, kind of a prototype. We wanted to use multimodal or voice solutions to untether the teacher from the front of the room. We, it was like a naked motherboard with an off-the-shelf component. We went into the classroom because we like, before we productize anything, we're not trying to bring a consumer product into the classroom. We went in, 
And we had students come and tell us, we love that the teacher is right next to me. We're like, okay, fine. There's a directional signal over here so uh, we can get in. So uh, at Merlin Mind, we are building uh, a co-pilot for educators with educators and, a pla and an AI platform to power that. Um, in, uh, I think a lot of the use cases have already been mentioned. Uh, in, in class instruction, uh, we are able to help the teacher basically manage tech, hardware and software. And we're in about 33 uh, states in the, in, in the country. Uh, and we're also looking at uh, out-of-class use cases like lesson uh, planning and uh, you know, rubric generation, et cetera. On the platform side, we've, uh, and this is where we're kind of moving a little away from the larger models because it's important for us to get the right size, right model size for the right task, which means we need to understand what these tasks are in education. So we're looking at it and saying, you want your content aligned with standards. So we have a model for that. We, uh, we have something called a tool former. Given an utterance, we wanted to know which tool to invoke, which agent to invoke, and what action to take. Uh, we have rubric-based summarization. We uh, are, are looking at, given a dialogue one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many, how do I figure out what the next pedagogical uh, or meaningful uh, move is uh, and uh, could be an activity, a game, a question, an assessment. So we've, we're building this platform, systematically building it to find these uh, point uh, uh, use cases and tasks that we will recompose for our assistant, but we think others can as well. And, and, uh, uh, and we're doing this safely. For us, pre-Gen AI, we've been very mindful about uh, entering this regulated environment. And, and that means everything from COPPA, FERPA, and, and like you said, the, the data agreements. Uh, and it, a lot has been done, by the way. It, it, you know. uh, and and uh, we've decided not to save the audio, whatever we collect, past transcription. Uh, more recently, we've been very mindful about all the issues that were raised earlier, hallucination, misinformation, uh, and uh, we're, we're training for appropriateness. What ex and we're having these conversations with educators, and this is why this forum is very important to say, what exactly does appropriateness mean? Uh, when you say great appropriate, when someone brings up an example of bullying, do you just shut off that conversation, or do you actually engage and say that's a teaching moment or a learning moment? And those aren't obvious choices from K through 12. It's gonna change. Uh, so it's quite exciting for us, and, and that's where we're at right now. Absolutely. Well, yeah, the, that's a, a pretty hard problem for a human, too, to, to Very much so. handle <laughs> bullying or cyberbullying, for that matter. Um, so in just summarizing out of this, what, what do you think AI models are best at, and what are they not so good at? Sure. I mean, one fantastic thing that has happened, and I've personally been, and so has everyone, been uh, impressed with, is it's just astounding synthesis. I think the summarization capability, from when you pull from different disparate knowledge sources, it's able to bring that together. And, and, and the second thing is, because of the scale and complexity, we used to deal with millions of parameters, we're dealing with billions right now, that's really improved the language understanding. It's, it's very compelling. Content moderation is very good. Code generation is very good. Um, on the things that, are, that we've seen, observed, not working so well, reasoning, I think that's still work in progress, especially in something like math. Uh, there has, I mean, I know there are, there's a lot of effort, which is very impressive. I think they're looking at outcome-based reward models to kind of overcome these autoregressive uh, model issues, but reasoning is one, planning, and when I say reasoning, I include common sense in that. Planning is something it struggles with. Uh, I think there is a trust barrier that we're trying to break. I, uh, so reliability, so the same issues of, uh, the, the notion of sycophancy, which is like you have your uh, model uh, comply a little too much to the user preference, uh, and, and so that overrides some facts, uh, uh, but what's beautiful is I think we have some fantastic minds, including this institution, uh, working on these problems. But those are places where we've seen, I would also say, there aren't as many specialized LLMs, something we're working on uh, for those tasks. Uh, sorry. Great, thank you so much. Well, shifting gears a little bit, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more about 
who we're reaching and how we're reaching the less privileged. And of course, you know, we've already heard some great work that you're doing, Bebek, but I'm, I'm interested, Sherry, if you could tell us like more broadly in your role as head of social impact, um, how do you reach the kids around the world that we want to reach and that may have the, the least support around them? Thank you for the question. Uh, so there are a number of different ways that we're working to reach students and teachers around the world. Perhaps the number one way that we're increasing access uh, is by rolling out ChatGPT, including the free version of our platform, to a growing number of countries around the world, including many low-income countries. And as we discussed before, um, there are a number of ways that teachers and students can use that platform directly for educational purposes once they do get access. We've also increased access by enabling companies around the world to build education apps on our platform, including apps for their specific regions. Our goal, of course, is not just to expand access to the use of our AI tool, but also to democratize who gets to build um, AI-powered tools. So as we were talking about before, with our new GPT tool, students and teachers around the world will be able to create their own AI assistants and tailor them to their unique education context and cultural context. Finally, we're growing our philanthropic support for expanding access to education technology for underserved students and teachers uh, around the world. Uh, just to give you a couple examples of that, we're partnering with an organization called Turn.io to build an accelerator for social impact organizations across the global south uh, who will be using AI power tools to massively expand their impact and reach to more low-income countries. Um, we're also partnering with Schmidt Futures on their global education technology competition, which I know many folks in this room are familiar with, and through both of these initiatives, we're planning to offer grants, OpenAI API credits, as well as technical assistance from OpenAI experts to social impact organizations, including education organizations, uh, to help them expand their impact and reach. Of course, expanding students' access to AI-powered technology is just half the equation, as we've all been talking about. It's really important that we ensure that students can use the technology safely and responsibly and ethically. So that's why we've also partnered with other organizations like AIEDU and the International Society for Technology and Education to support efforts to train teachers on how to work with AI appropriately in their classrooms. Great, thank you so much. Well, so uh, like in the spirit of, you know, things that we need to, to be expanding and doing, um, Victor, can I ask you what applications of AI in education would you like to see more of and what are the unmet needs, the most important unmet needs you see now? Well, um, there's been a lot of talk about tutoring and we have some really great evidence and, and progress in, in the field on that. Um, but I really like to see and I'm heartened to see some movement towards teachers. How can we make AI tools to make teachers' lives better? How can we make it so that they can get back to teaching again? What brought them into the profession? And not to replace them, but to give them the time to do the work that really only teachers are able to do. So I'd like to see a lot more on that front. Um, but also, you know, it's very easy to start thinking about this typical classroom in your mind and not realize the whole range of populations. So like, how much are we talking about special education? You know, are we talking about tools that are gonna help more students to participate um, if they have learning differences or 504 plans? Um, are we thinking um, deeply about multilingual classrooms and how we can make things more accessible for a whole range of students? Are we thinking about the whole range of subject matter? So math and um, language arts are definitely important, but there are so many different ways in which we could think about how are we gonna do art differently? How are we going to do PE differently? Um, how do we do geography differently? And I think that there's a lot of space to involve a whole range of educators. And if you look in, in schools, there's so many people in there. It's not just teachers and students, but you have school librarians, and you have paraprofessionals and aides and administrators. So I'd really like to see us really bringing together all of the ranges of tools and thinking about all these different users and that big system. 
Um, parents as well. I think that parents want to know what's going on. They're overloaded by information as well. Um, they appreciate what teachers are doing, but they also you know, are pressed for time too. And so how can we use AI to support teachers in their own educational efforts um, as well? So there's things of that nature that I'd definitely like to see um, that, that I think the people in this room could take up and, and help move the ball. Excellent. Well, Babak, what about you from your experience? What are the unmet needs yeah, this is perfect. I, I flew across the country for this question, right? Because uh, a lot of because a lot of y'all are going to solve these, right? So here's here's what I would say. Like uh, 150 years ago, uh, it was considered like if you knew Latin, then you were like educated, and if you didn't know Latin, it really didn't matter what else you knew because you you were an uneducated person, right? Um, I'd venture to say many of you don't know Latin, right? And you seem perfectly fine to me, right? Um, what I'm worried about right now with the EdTech tools is they're uh, doing, like, uh, they're solving yesterday's problem in the sense of, like, we're doing more of the subject areas and the things that actually don't matter as much anymore. Like, uh, like a great AI tutor helping with a kid with Latin is, like, great, right? But, like, is that actually preparing them for their future, right? And so what I'm hopeful for is that when we think about the future um, for like every kid, right? Like, so like I went to Harvard, my brother went to Harvard. Like we're not talking about that, that type of person, right? We're talking about like the like 80 to 90% of people who are just like very normal, hardworking, good people, right? Like what do people need in order for them to be extremely successful in the life that they're picking up and going for, right? Um, and as we look at education for our kids, we have situations where, like, I'm Iranian by descent, right? As much as I'd love for everyone to know about the Persian Empire and, like, how great we made the world, right? Um, I don't actually think that that should be a core part of education for every kid. Um, if you want to learn that, then you should. Um, but I think the core part of education should be getting the sort of key pieces of content knowledge that allow you to solve problems that matter for you um, and matter for your community. And I think this is particularly important um, for our students of color, um, for our students who are uh, in, in uh, impoverished communities or underserved communities, um, both in the US and across the world, right? So as I'm looking around, I love the ideas of like making teaching easier. That's an extremely, extremely hard uh, task, uh, and I don't think it's a, a well-designed job. And where we can help design the job to make it better and easier, that, that, that's great. Um, I, I also think, though, that where it allows students to sort of explore their passions and aspirations, and like you learn the content because you care about the end goal of what you're trying to solve, um, that's when we're getting to a place where we're deeply engaging like who the child is, what they want to be in the world, as opposed to being like the empty vessel that we're trying to unload content or tutor content into, right? Um, and so I'm really hopeful that you all will help me with this uh, because the tools right now, um, by and large, are helping with like more reading, more math, more whatever um, specific skill. But like many of those things in our interaction with them are going to completely change and are already changing in the world, right? Um, like if you don't know how to write a formal letter right now, like what do you do? You go onto Microsoft Word and they have a template, right? How many of us spent hours in classroom somewhere learning the formal letter template, right? Or learning how to write in cursive, right? I actually didn't do that. Um, I went to a school in third grade where they taught it in fourth, and we moved and went to another school where they <laughs> taught it in third grade. And so I couldn't read the teacher's board for about two years, right? Um, but I was okay. Like, I learned how to sign my name, and we're going to be fine, right? Um, but I say this to say that, like, by and large, like, I think there's a lot of really good work going on. The question is, are we solving problems that matter for the future of where we want kids to go, or are we sort of going to where the sort of puck has been? Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for that great answer. So we have about two minutes left, and we've done a great job panel on being constructive and talking about all the great opportunities, maybe um, without closing on a negative note. Let me give Sherrod maybe the last word here. And could you say a few things in two minutes or less on the risks? <laughs> I thought you didn't want to go with the negative. <laughs> uh, I, I know there's a this lot of talk about degenerative AI, uh, which... Um, I, I would start off by saying I think we, we need to view it uh, as uh, AI being uh, complementing and not competing. And, and it's an assistant, not a replacement, as Victor was getting at. Um, and, and if I were to break some of what uh, people are afraid of into technical and non-technical, just the technical part I think we will solve. It's a point in time. But we have some of the issues mentioned like uh, hallucination. There's some fantastic work we saw earlier this week 
uh, and solving, uh, you know, algorithmically making advances over there. Uh, privacy, safety, there's some phenomenal efforts around rent teaming, internal and external uh, uh, model collapse, which is synthetic data actually causing echo chambers in the data you can get better data sets. What's amazing about that is that's a wonderful opportunity and the community is on top of it. They're getting better data sets, better benchmarks, evaluation toolkits. Stanford's doing a fantastic job there. Uh, uh, on the non-technical side, some of the issues are big tech dominance. That's been, uh, you know, so people are afraid about that. Well, for starters, we're not a big uh, company, so, uh, but I think there's an opportunity for open source, for startups to come right in over here for research practice partnerships. You know, we've, we've been working with Bruce, which has been outstanding. To, some, to someone uh, said in an earlier panel, I think you, you have some amazing ideas and data already there, uh, help synthesize that. So I think uh, the other thing I've heard uh, in terms of risk, and I'm not going the existential risk, I'm keeping that out of this discussion, uh, it's, uh, but is people are using schools as experimental labs. I think that framing is incomplete and probably a little unfair because if we want to co-create the solution, we need all stakeholders to be involved right from the beginning, from concept to design to uh, you know, development to deployment, right from the entire cycle. Um, and, uh, and if that's not happening, we can shift the dialogue to that, saying why is it not happening early on? But uh, I wouldn't really frame it as a, as a lab as much as, yes, we need to do this together. We need to understand the problems together. Uh, and and I, I want to end with this uh, quick thing that, see, technology has this transformative power. But if we want it to be a force multiplier, we need to co-create. We need to collaborate. You know, there's a call to action for all of us to come together and speak the same language. That doesn't happen as much as we'd like. Uh, so yeah, I would end with uh, you know uh, a call for more partnerships. Excellent. Well, I, I know that the audience has been listening attentively here, and I feel like I've learned so much from this panel. So we're just incredibly grateful to all of you for being here to share your wisdom, and um, thanks very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.